Uh, in the final presentation today, I'd like to share with you uh, some of the work that we've been doing with uh, funding from the Midwest Food Products Association, looking at using natural hormones to regulate uh, plant growth. And to put it in the most simple terms I possibly could, really we're taking a tortoise and hare approach here. Uh, in, in our typical vegetable cropping systems, we often find that uh, they're more like the tortoise. Not only do these crops emerge very slowly, uh, things like carrots, onions, cabbage, table beets, uh, but they often emerge and germinate and emerge uh, rather erratically. So it's not a full uh, emergence at that point. So with that in mind, uh, our approach here is to look at how we might give uh, the crops a competitive advantage over the weeds, which are more like the hair in this uh, scenario. So our vegetable crop in the uh, tortoise above, the weeds in the hair below, and we're trying to give the vegetable crop an advantage. That would be one approach that we could take in this scenario. How do we get the crops out of the ground faster and more completely? Or the other scenario that we're investigating in very simplistic terms is how do we set the weeds back to give the crop an advantage? Can we delay uh, early emergence of weeds using natural plant uh, regulators? So in more concrete terms, how do we use that more practically to create a crop advantage? Uh, we could suppress weed seed germination and early growth through field applications of natural plant growth regulators. We could increase and synchronize weed seed germination at the same time as our pre-emergent herbicides are applied. Uh, most weeds germinate over a period of months. Uh, so they outlast the time in which we would have a residual herbicide in most of these uh, situations. Uh, so can we synchronize weed seed germination such that they're uh, germinating at a time that they're susceptible to the pre-emergent herbicides in their residual phase? We also are interested in ways that we might increase and synchronize crop seed germination with seed treatments. Uh, many vegetable crops, of course, have moved to prime seed. Uh, and it would be fairly simple and affordable to be able to add a component to those existing seed treatments to increase and synchronize that germination, uh, particularly of the slow germinators and emergers. Uh, and also to look at improving crop competitiveness through early foliar applications that establish a competitive canopy earlier. Uh, so those are the areas uh, or our tactics in which we're investigating in this work. And there is some uh, background to this. However, much of this early work either was done many years ago uh, or was done with a different uh, objective in mind, such as influencing uh, gerberulic acid uh, work in carrots to reduce the severity of alternaria leaf blight. In our case, we have a different objective. We're looking at making these crops more competitive. Uh, there are some scant and somewhat incomplete reports in the literature uh, dating back to the 60s up through the 1980s. Uh, but most of that work, to be quite candid, uh, didn't get very far because we had very good and effective uh, herbicides in many of these crops. So it didn't proceed beyond that very preliminary investigation phase. And we have some products out there that have labels that have uh, rather nebulous descriptions of these plant, natural plant growth regulator effects on many crops. And I share one with you from uh, carrots here in the ProGib label, just as one example, uh, where it's noted that dilutions of greater concentration can increase the risk of excessive top growth. In our case, that's a bit of our objective if we can do it while also having disease resistance uh, in those plants, as well as uh, being able to maintain the yield and quality uh, that we need. Uh, so again, we're starting in a kind of a nebulous background of many different reports here, uh, which is really uh, setting us back in the preliminary research stage. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, we became very interested in the topic and uh, admittedly maybe a bit carried away. Uh, so in the past year and a half or so, even uh, with our COVID restrictions on field research, uh, we've conducted 16 studies so far uh, everything from pre Petri dish studies uh, to looking at field applications 
of these natural plant growth regulators uh, and a variety of crops, primarily processing vegetable crops, but with other funding, we've also looked at uh, potatoes uh, and cranberries. Now, obviously in the next 15 minutes or so that are left, I won't be able to share with you the results of these, of every study, but I'm gonna hit some of the highlights uh, in more of a storytelling fashion of how we've moved through this and designed and carried out uh, our research with very little background to build that uh, from. So the first question we asked is, can we influence weed and crop germination uh, to create a competitive advantage? This seemed like a spot where we can intercept or carry out a, a strategy uh, that doesn't involve a field application uh, necessarily to try to control weeds, but uh, in, instead we're trying to move the tortoise faster ahead of the hare uh, by giving the crops an advantage in germination and emergence. And I've shared some of this uh, with the group in the past, so I'll, I'll just keep this part uh, rather short. Uh, there's a lot on these slides, and I apologize in this presentation. I am sharing more data slides than I normally do to try to uh, show the progression of our research. Uh, but I'll just hit the bottom lines here with, with all this. In this case, we're looking at the effect of abscisic acid, a natural plant hormone uh, that is available in synthetic and organically approved products uh, on common lambs quarter seed germination. We've done this with a number of weeds ranging from Palmer amaranth to water hemp and velvet leaf. Uh, but this is an example of common lambs quarters. Uh, looking at three different rates of abscisic acid and a non-treated check. Uh, the non-treated check, we see uh, early germination, a spike of germinating about six days after treatment and uh, planting. Whereas if we look at the highest rate of abscisic acid over on the right-hand side of your screen, we're able to delay that germination by about 10 days uh, with the seed treatment in this case. Uh, so this gives us the background that we're able to uh, delay germination, at least in a Petri dish type approach. Remember, we're starting really from square one with much of this, uh, but that gave us hope to investigate this further. The more practical way of looking at this, again, is to be able to see if there's something we could add to our existing uh, seed treatments or in the priming process for the really slow germinators and incomplete emergers, carrots, table beets, uh, cabbage and such. And we've done this again with a number of crops. I'm showing you an example here. We're up to about a dozen crops right now, ranging from lima beans uh, to the carrots that I show you here. And in this case, we're looking at gibberellic acid, another uh, existing plant hormone, uh, and, and influencing germination by providing it in excess at a time that it normally wouldn't be available to the seed. And across the board, we're able to stimulate this carrot seed germination quickly uh, across a number of different rates, some of them uh, extremely low, 100 parts per million. Uh, not only do we get faster germination, about 10 days faster uh, than the non-treated check, uh, but we also get more complete germination. Uh, so this is an area uh, that we continue to explore that I think could be incorporated quite practically and affordably into our existing systems. I'm a visual learner and this gives us an opportunity to look uh, on our screens at what that uh, might look like in these early Petri dish studies. Uh, this is with common lambs quarters nine days after planting. On the left-hand side, you see four replicates of non-treated uh, Petri dishes. And on the right-hand side, uh, the 16 ounce per hundred pound of seed uh, rate that we we're investigating with the abscisic acid. And uh, obviously the non-treated check looks like a, a chia pet in those uh, Petri dishes. And on the right-hand side, we see very few if any uh, seeds germinated nine days after uh, treatment and seeding. Meanwhile, the opposite is true with carrots uh, with gibberellic acid. And again, we're looking at the non-treated on the left. We see one replicate has a few uh, germinated seed and on the right-hand side, uh, almost uh, complete emergence at that stage. Uh, so that's uh, nine days after planting, uh, and this gave us a lot of hope in those early treatments. However, uh, the story gets more complicated, of course. When we take it to the field, uh, we don't exactly see those results, and that uh, makes us ask why 
uh, in the further replicates of this work, uh, we didn't see the same effect. To make a long story short, you may have noticed the timestamp on some of the early pictures there. Uh, those were done in the fall and winter in the head house of one of our greenhouses that's pretty cold uh, at that time. And the graduate student, Jordan Schuler, working on this project, followed this up with similar work uh, in a lab on campus uh, that was at 68 to 75 degrees and did not get the same results. Uh, to cut the story short here, what we found out really is that temperature makes a difference in these seed treatments and that maybe in carrot seed that's planted early in the season, we would see a very strong uh, benefit to enhancing germination with gibberellic acid treatment. However, in the later planted carrots, uh, the opposite is true. Remember, these are natural plant hormones in a very complicated system biologically uh, that's exposed to different environments. Uh, so we have, that's why we've done so many uh, studies at this point, and we continue to do so is to kind of work through the complications of messing with biology. Uh, so excuse me, let, on the left-hand side, we see with uh, treatment. At uh, the bottom uh, uh, dot here on the, the slide is the non-treated. And we see as we increase rate, uh, we get germination enhancement when the germination is at 60 Fahrenheit. On the right-hand side, the opposite is true. Uh, the top is the non-treated. And with treatment of gibberellic acid at 75 degree uh, Petri dishes, uh, we actually reduce germination. Uh, with the gibberellic acid treatment. So I wouldn't go out and prime all your seed at this point. Uh, there's still a lot of details to work out in this, uh, but in the right conditions, we see very consistent uh, enhancement. So we're also looking at uh, many different ways to influence uh, weed seed response uh, to plant growth regulators. And we won't get into the details on this slide too much. We're looking at a number of different uh, natural plant hormones. And there are a few key takeaways here. Number one, this is our first attempt at actually applying these to a soil surface. So out of a conventional boom on a soil surface, allowing them to be irrigated or rain fed uh, into the system. And the real takeaway here is there's a lot of variability but some of these treatments are quite effective. On the left-hand side, we have the non-treated uh, seed nine days after treatment. And if you take, for example, uh, the yellow bar here, there's not a lot of variability with this particular natural uh, plant hormone at that rate. And we had very little germination in a field application to a soil surface. So there is hope here, but again, like the gibberellic acid and the temperature treatments, the devil is in the details. And I titled this uh, something about teenagers and hormones because it's just the right amount that makes things happen the way that we want. Too little or too much, it's like Goldilocks and the three bears with these. And we need to figure out uh, just the right temperature porridge to uh, make these uh, work out well. So then we moved on and looked at uh, can foliar applications increase uh, gibberellic acid uh, or foliar applications of gibberellic acid uh, increase the competitiveness. Uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, carrots. Uh, and I'll share one study that uh, we did in 2017, looking at three different carrot varieties on four uh, gibberellic acid application rates in the field. And again, we're looking for simplicity here. Uh, we're actually tank mixing these with our typical caparol applications at three and five leaf carrots, looking for something simple that you could put in at a very low dose uh, between 200 and 500 parts per million uh, to increase that uh, foliar growth and subsequent uh, competitiveness. And what we saw in this preliminary work that in the, again, the right conditions, uh, it worked quite effectively. We can increase carrot height uh, with increasing doses of gibberellic acid applied twice. We can increase carrot top biomass. Again, it's just the right amount. You need the right temperature porridge, which in this case was about 300 parts per million uh, split over two applications. And uh, we can get increases, slight increases, not statistically significant 
uh, but we can get uh, increases or at least maintain our carrot root biomass. And if you remember that one ProJib label, that's a gibberellic acid product, uh, the risk there is you can swing that pendulum too far and have excessive top growth at the cost of not partitioning carbohydrates to the root growth. Uh, so in this work, uh, the early work in 2017, we're able to find kind of that, uh, that sweet spot to be able to do so. This is what it looks like. Again, as a visual learner in the field, you see more weeds and less carrot growth in the non-treated on the left-hand side. Uh, and a picture taken on the same day with the 400 parts per million uh, split across two applications on the right-hand side. More carrot growth and uh, fewer weeds. So the foliar applications, to summarize, we've done a lot of studies on this over the past few years. It works sometimes, but certainly not always. In subsequent research, we didn't see carrot growth stimulation, but we did actually see some weed growth stimulation. And again, I think that's related to temperature. Those applications were later in the year. Uh, so uh, at that point, we have that same uh, effect that we saw with the seed where in warmer conditions, we don't see the effect, we may actually see an inhibitory uh, effect. So uh, one piece though, anecdotally in trying this in large strip trials and such, seems to work better in cooler seasons, as I've mentioned. Uh, and it does seem to help us overcome some of the uh, prometrin, the caparol or vegetable pro stunting that we sometimes see. Uh, we're, we seem to be able to pull it out of that a little bit faster uh, in these treatments. So foreshadowing our 2021 work, we're gonna try earlier foliar applications when it's generally cooler weather and the weeds are still controlled by those pre-emergent herbicides with the hope that we're not uh, stimulating uh, the weed growth, but we might be able uh, to uh, stimulate carrot growth in the earlier cooler season uh, when their growth is traditionally extremely slow. And we'll expand that work also incidentally to uh, some of the slower growing processing crops like direct seeded cabbage, table beets, uh, and onions. So toward a practical application, just uh, again, highlighting uh, some of the pieces from the work in, in treating soil. Uh, you see in the left-hand side, all of these trays have the same uh, volume of seed of, in this case, common lambs quarters and carrots, non-treated on the left abscisic acid in the middle, and we've inhibited some of the common lambs quarters growth uh, while the carrots are still growing. And then on the right-hand side, uh, gibberellic acid, where we've stretched out the common lambs quarters uh, growth and the carrots are, are still down below uh, in the trays. So really moving towards uh, the practical applications in these phases. So where do we go from here? Uh, to the field. Uh, and in our 2021 studies, uh, what we anticipate doing uh, is using the gibberellic acid combined with the broadcast pre-emergent herbicides, uh, focusing on those four slow growing processing crops at this point uh, to stimulate and synchronize the weed and crop seed germination. Uh, so uh, that'll be in, in field work as opposed to some of the Petri dish and greenhouse work that we've done in the past. Uh, we'll look at using treated crop seed to stimulate and synchronize crop seed germination as we've done in our greenhouse work. Uh, so we'll be incorporating these into our uh, traditional seed treatments and moving them to the field in larger scale evaluation. And then again, as I just mentioned, expanding on that foliar growth regulator application uh, with a focus on that early season and the early crop growth when the weather's cooler and traditionally these crops are uh, very slow to emerge uh, and establish themselves. Uh, so that's, a, that's what we have uh, planned for moving ahead uh, with the idea of incorporating this uh, certainly not as a silver bullet, not as a replacement for the herbicides that we rely on in these crops, uh, but as a component in a more holistic integrated management system. And we just published some work that we did on such an approach in carrots. And again, this is where we're expanding into the beets, uh, cabbage and onions in the upcoming year. Uh, but in that case, we looked at uh, a number of different components in a large factorial design. How can we incorporate them uh, where every little hammer does a piece of the job, but we're not uh, swinging one large sledgehammer to, to do all the work itself. 
Uh, so in the current state, as an example on the left, we have a less competitive variety in a traditional three row carrot bed, uh, no gibberellic acid uh, and planting as early as we can get in there in the soil in a more traditional approach. On the future state, on the right hand side, a more competitive variety. In this case, we have a five row system. I'm well aware of that that has implications in terms of uh, planting, but more so in terms of the harvest equipment and pulling these carrots. Uh, we have been talking to some of the uh, uh, equipment manufacturers and they're able to uh, accommodate such a system. Uh, I do realize there's an, a significant expense to that, but we're forward looking here. Uh, gibberellic acid, this is in a cool season, early application. Uh, or cooler time of, of year in an earlier carrot application. In this case, the most significant factor that we found was delaying planting by 10 to 14 days. Uh, incidentally, in our three years of doing that, uh, we had no difference in yield between early and late planting uh, those carrots, about two weeks difference in planting. It didn't come at a yield cost. Uh, but that was two weeks less that we didn't have to babysit the crop and we had fewer uh, weeds in that approach. Uh, so we see some hope there and maybe uh, modifying some of our current systems uh, to be able to incorporate that uh, important component. It was a real game changer for us. Uh, so again, we're looking at the more uh, holistic way that we can integrate each of these components into our existing systems in ways that are reasonable and economically uh, feasible. Uh, to give us a longer term approach, uh, battle herbicide resistance, uh, and the lack of registrations that we see in many of these uh, minor crops. And so with that, uh, this presentation and others will be shared on the website that uh, you see below. Uh, at this point, I'll stop sharing my screen. If you happen to have any uh, questions, I'd be pleased to uh, take those. And once I stop sharing, I'll be able to see the uh, chat box. Uh, so John Williams uh, asked the question, have you seen any increased incidence in carrot bolting in any of these treatments? Very good question, uh, John. Uh, in gibberellic acid uh, with late treatments and some varieties, there can be an uh, increase in bolting. Uh, so that's very important to uh, note that. Uh, and others have in, in subsequent research, remember these are hormones they influence every part of growth from germination to senescence, including reproduction. Uh, so that is a risk. I would suggest, uh, you know, if anybody were to want to try that, uh, keep in mind that the cooler earlier applications seem to be more useful, but it's variety dependent. So I would want to know that before um, you would, you would uh, check out the bolting in that case. Um, in our work, because we're focused on the early season and extremely low rates, we did not see a bolting, but it is a risk and it's something that should be investigated on a, a variety basis. Uh, Joshua Johnson asks, do you plant on treating, or do I plan on treating crops other than carrots with these hormones to evaluate impact on growth and competitiveness? Uh, so bean, sweet corn, onion. Uh, the answer is in our early work, we have done that. We had, I believe, 10 or 12 different crops in our earliest work. Uh, the different bean varieties that we grow, lima, snap, dry beans, um, onions, cabbage, table beets, uh, I'm sure peas, I'm sure I'm leaving a few out. Uh, so I think probably the most concise way that I could summarize it is the larger the seed, the less effect we had. Uh, in our smaller seeded, traditionally slow germinating, poor germinators, uh, we did have more of an effect. Maybe it's because that uh, tortoise was set farther behind the starting line than it would be with something like a snap bean that we can get out of the ground pretty quickly traditionally. Uh, but we had less of an effect, I would say, uh, the larger the crop seed size. And do you see any extra top growth uh, at the end of the year? Uh, yes, uh, in the carrots at least, that top growth carried through uh, towards the end of the year. Um, eventually, uh, the others caught up, uh, but it was in general terms, probably a 30 day lag uh, to be able to catch up 
uh, to those that had been treated. Our, Charlie asks, uh, were field germination studies done on sandy soils? I know they were done on a moderate silt loam soil. Uh, so that's a great question, uh, Charlie. And uh, this year they will be done on uh, sandy soils in a, more, uh, in a more complete study this year. Uh, Stuart asks, longer term, do you think the value is geared more toward weed suppression, keeping the hair held back? Or is the value in helping speed up the tortoise? Fantastic question, Stuart. Uh, my, my real focus and where I think there's more hope is in speeding up the tortoise. Uh, for one thing, you have a lot more control over that system. This is seed you're putting in the ground. You have the ability to treat. Um, and you have the ability to add things to your foliar applications, whereas a weed seed is traditionally dormant. About 40% of it, in general terms, is ready to germinate at any a given spring, but there's a, a weed seed reserve, of course, uh, that's dormant and not susceptible as much to these uh, hormones. Um, and as Charlie is noting in his question, really, uh, once we apply something to soil, we lose control like you do with a pre-emergent herbicide on sand. Uh, you don't have as much control over the, the system. Um, so I would anticipate less effect on weeds, for example, on a sandy soil with a three-inch gully washer uh, your, your dilution is not the solution in that case, and I would expect to have less effect. So when I think of this work, I think about what can I control most, and that's uh, the tortoise in this case. Uh, Jennifer asks, increase in late season root splits from excessive growth, uh, or does the effect wear off? And again, uh, that would be something that I would want to investigate on a variety specific basis. That's why I showed you in the, the carrot work, uh, three different varieties. We've done work on maybe six or seven varieties at this point. Um, and uh, they do vary. The, the response by, uh, uh, by variety really does uh, vary. So I would really want to investigate that specific to a variety and condition before I went out and loaded up a sprayer and such. And the work that we've done, uh, we do hand harvest every carrot. We count them and we note any quality effects. We had no forking or splitting uh, that was noted in the quality work uh, in our hand harvest of these plots. Uh, but again, don't go race out and buy it all now. I would uh, try a little bit uh, let us figure out this very complex system some more to be able to do that. Uh, Bill, uh, back to Bill Hutchison, uh, to, to go back a bit on the corn earworm piece uh, to Jennifer Thompson's question. Uh, to confirm, we were referring to corn earworm flights. Also related, I want to emphasize that according to our annual fall surveys of Europe European corn borer, we continue to confirm historically low uh, corn, European corn borer, both Wisconsin and Minnesota. So processors should be seeing very low to zero ECD and sweet corn at vast majority of locations. So timing of insecticides now are focused mostly on corn earworm. Be sure everyone is on the same page. Thank you, Bill, for that. And if Bill or Brian, if you, if you want to unmute and address that in more detail, please feel free to. And if not, we have it noted in the uh, chat here. Any final questions uh, for any of the speakers at this point? I see that we're all still on. I'll give you just a second to type that in should you have an interest in that. Uh, so Jennifer notes, uh, most of our splits are due to poor germ and in turn giving them a lot of room to expand. So maybe GA could avoid that indirectly by improving stand. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, uh, for that comment. And again, you know, <laughs> dabble with this on your own should you consider trying it. But uh, that, that really is where uh, we have an interest not only in increasing the pace of germination, but improving our stand. And we have seen uh, at least in our greenhouse and petri dish work, uh, we've been able to increase carrot stands, for example, by 20 to 30%. Uh, so you pay for the seed, let's hope we get it all out of the ground as fast as we can uh, in being able to uh, do that. 
But again, dabble with it on your own. These, they have a, the dose makes the poison in this case. Uh, these are natural horm hormones. So it's a bit unpredictable and we're in the early stages of that research.